August 28th of 2009 was the first day that uh, Jane Curtis began exploring history with us on GSV TV. So today we wanted to take a look back at our at her history and the things that she's looked into, um, a retrospective on the past 10 years, and look at that very first episode. So here, enjoy. That goes way, way back in history. You can see that the general shape of the whole thing here is, yeah. is round, it's in a circle. Well, the subject is Attila the Hun. Okay. And I think probably most people, when they think of Attila the Hun, think of some sort of Hulk, you know, and the situation being far, far away. So right over here, in, and it was radiocarbon dated, some of these things. Yeah. So that's fairly convincing. But Catherine, take one look here, for example, at the picture in the upper right of the sheet here, mm -hmm. and what they were doing, and what you've just shown me, very slick now in comparison, they would take a board in order to prepare things. The one very, very interesting thing they had was using feathers, and there has been, have been references to using feathers for clothing before that. Mm. So they bartered with the boy, they realized that he was probably, he found it, the mother had probably been killed. Sure there to him and, and the uh, sloping shoulders, the low shoulders, pointed nose. Uh, this was more like what Wojtek really looked like. It's comfortable, a huge teddy bear. The video now on Bessie Coleman. Famous inventors such as Wilbur and Orville Wright from Dayton, Ohio. So it really hit the fan. In this country, as I mentioned, I think, uh, in 1915, no, I didn't mention this, died in um, 1968. Mm. She lived way on yes. until, until that time. Uh, now, pictures, please. First picture. And I think we uh, will we'll again have a very exciting program for you. And as a matter of fact, for those old timers around here, this is a, a program that we had about five years ago and on Stonehenge and uh, certain things have happened and we've had a lot of new residents and plus uh, us older folks have forgotten things occasionally so uh, Jane Curtis and I have decided that this would be a good time to visit, revisit Stonehenge. And Jane, welcome to the program on Village in Motion and uh, let's talk about Stonehenge a little bit. First of all, where in the world is it? For those of us that might not know exactly. Where in the world is it? Well, yeah. it's in England, it's, the well, island of well, Britain. Well, that's a good start. It's a good start, <laughs> and it's uh, um, not very far north of the south coast of England, and it's just about in the middle, east and west wise. It's on the Downs, yeah. um, around where Salisbury is, RAF okay. Air Base, other okay. interesting things. Yeah, well, we have military and here that know that. Most of England is pretty historical, but this area is very historical. Lots of things have washed over it. Okay. In this central southern England. Okay, well, let's show a picture here of what it looks like. Uh, and if we can get uh, get the camera on it and... and uh, what uh, it actually is, is a sort of mysterious installation here yeah. uh, that goes way, way back in history. And you can see that the general shape of the whole thing here is, yeah. is round, it's in a circle. Yeah. And in the center here, and we'll be looking at this more closely, is a uh, monumental structure of large stones put up long, long time ago. We'll talk more about this, of course, a little more in detail. Yeah. But we don't quite know what the exact purpose was, but we have lots of theories. Well. And it's interesting where they came from and so on. And you can see that, uh, looking down on it from the air here, it doesn't look terribly impressive, but we're going to look at well, some pictures. Well, let's look at the next picture on the then. Ground. Jane. Let's just do that. Okay, here I can hold up, and you can sort of point uh, if we can get our camera again on this. And you can see that some of these little little points that we saw from the air are actually these trilithon structures. It's a magnificent ruin. Of yeah, now, how how big roughly are. is that, Jane? That we're looking the, at there, just uh, these in things round are figures. Roughly, these stones are roughly 14 feet. High. Yeah. Okay. And you can see possibly that they're um, partially dressed, you know, by human hand. Yeah. Uh, they've been made to a, a uniform height, and they're roughly pillars. And on top of them, you have lintels. And we're going to see a sketch in a moment 
of how this would have looked in its original yeah. form. But these lintels go on top of the of the, uh, the double stone columns here. Yeah. And actually, this is in the interior of it. We're going to look at the structure of the whole installation. And we're going to try to see some things that it might have been. It's okay. mysterious. We don't know exactly what for. Well, but let's, seeing how, how big it is. Well, let's look at it then the way. Here's, here's mm -hmm. a, what you referred to on this top picture. And the, yeah, now this picture. Can we get a shot of it? You can see that it looks like a closed circle. It looks like a colonnade here. And these tall stones came around at approximately equal intervals. And there were lintel stones on the top. Now, there, at one time there was an outer ring, another time there was an inner ring, uh, and they had a sort of a U-shaped thing here, and they had the biggest trilithon, the biggest triple stone installation or figure here uh, at one end. And this was, uh, the whole thing was oh, well over 20 feet tall, and these are stones that are something like four tons for the smaller okay. ones. Uh, Jane, what, so the, the circumference, great. roughly, what, what is the, how, how, the circle? How uh, well, the diameter rough. was something like about 500 feet. Okay. So you can take it from there. And I seem to remember that the outer stones in the outer ring, uh, there, were, there were 80 of them. Yeah. Uh, and then a few were less in the interior. Okay. Now, do we want to look at the bottom part here now? Or? Uh, well, we can look at that for a moment. Um, this is not actually Stonehenge here, but it's like what Stonehenge was when it started. Okay. It was a little kind of a dirt embankment and a little ditch arrangement. So you can see clearly not for defense, but for yeah. some other purpose. And circular. And in uh, uh, the, the first picture we saw, um, this one, you could see Go vestiges back. of this dirt and ditch surrounding. Yeah, okay. And yeah. again, if this is about 500 feet, you realize that covers. Yeah. A good little piece of ground. Okay, so, yeah. okay, that gives us a pretty good uh, good picture. Now, how, how well you've said a little bit of how it's put together. Where did the stones come from? Do we the, know that? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, thanks to science and whatnot, um, <laughs> the outer ring of stones came from the local area, about 20 miles away in the Marlboro Downs, and that was sandstone. Uh, sedimentary. Let me interrupt you. What period of time are we talking about? It to be, when did what, what do they say that when the, when well, did this they, begin roughly? The, the stone working began a lot later in its history than the this original ditch and dirt yeah. surrounding, and we don't know the purpose of that. Um, but that came along somewhat later and it came uh, more than 2000 BC. Okay. All over that. And the exact guess is very low on that. Yeah, right? sure. But a good long time ago. Of course, by this time, the Egyptians had been through a couple of dynasties. Yeah. That might place it for you. This wasn't the only thing in the world that was that old. Yeah. Um, but the uh, setting up of the stones, this is already in the Bronze Age, what they heard was the Bronze Age. The setting up of the stones took place probably sometime between 2500, 2000 BC, somewhere around there. And these outer stones, uh, as I say, were in the vicinity. They, they got the sandstone locally, and it wasn't that much of a trick to bring it the 20 miles. Although I dare say one of these things at four yeah. tons and bringing a whole bunch of them over was a good trick. But the interior stones were, um, were special, and they did not come from there. They came from Wales. Which again, you look at a map of Britain. Now, and Wales. were those what they refer to as the blue stones? That's right. Or? Okay. And, and if, you, if you look at Wales on the map and, and the central southern England, you think, oh, well, that's not so far. But if you didn't have any modern equipment, it was extremely far. But they discovered, uh, and of course, science has dated these things as well, uh, that the blue stones came from Diffid in, in Wales. They're called blue stones, incidentally, because when they when you crack them apart. They look blue for a while until bluish, okay. until the air gets at them. So they were obviously something rather special. Uh, Stonehenge was rebuilt in these early times more than once, rearranged, so yeah. to speak. So we don't know the exact significance, but they were always in the in the center. What's the, what's the so, theory of how these large stones were, were brought? To, what, it was 100 and some miles in some cases, or um, that far? Well, as a crow flies, probably not more than that, but you see, they, they needed to do it um, using water because okay. these things were so very heavy, deep water. So the theory is that either 
they just went down to the coast and differed there from Wales in the north, of the north side of the Bristol Channel and around, completely in up the Severn River, and On then rest. overland. Mm -hmm. And they would have used probably rollers. Carts okay. would probably not have been as practical. Rollers yeah. or sledges, like the Egyptians. Yeah. But if they didn't do it that way, then they would almost have had to do it by going completely down around Land's End and along the south coast of England, and then up however many miles it was, I don't know, 20 miles or something like that, up from, up from the south coast. Yeah. Uh, they would have had to bring it up. So a pretty good trick. But when you get to tradition, and what Geoffrey of Monmouth said in the 12th century in his history, which was uh, half fiction, but he said, he got Merlin into the act here. He said, oh, no, yeah. all this took place in the days of King Arthur, yeah. which, of course, was the 5th century sure. A.D. and just didn't come <coughs> into the picture at all. But, uh, no, no, that's how it happened, he said. And um, they, they told, our, they told uh, the king, Ambrosius, that he, they, uh, the king said, I want to build a memorial to our good warriors who were killed by the Saxons. So somebody said, well, ask Merlin. So he goes and gets Merlin, <laughs> who lives nearby in central England. Yeah. Merlin says, oh, go get the Dance of the Giants from Ireland. Yeah. So they do. And of course, Ireland and Wales were often confounded in ancient history yeah. as being similar and sort of over in the same direction. But he says that they were then brought magically over. But the fact of the matter is that they were undoubtedly brought from Diffid in Wales yeah. by water and then the land last way. Now how they got them erected. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what, what, what's the theory there? There had yeah. to be a tremendous amount of manpower, and I guess in those days it would be manpower, it right? It would be manpower, yeah. yeah. Uh, they might have done something with leverage, except yeah. that you wonder what they could have used as a lever. Uh, but chances are they did what the Egyptians did. They would build a huge mound of earth. Okay. And then is there any use, evidence there to suggest that that, that no, archaeologists have found? No, there's not. But they would have smoothed down the earth again later. Okay. Uh, there's evidence that, that this took place pretty early because on a lot of these stones you have things like mother goddess, earth goddess oh. uh, representations, and later on you had axes, which contributes to the idea that there was some sort of a a development. It wasn't always the same. Yeah. in its purpose or whatever. Uh, but the, uh, once the stones had arrived, they, however they managed to get the, the, uh, the uprights probably could have been erected with ropes, pull them if they had enough manpower. But how they got the lintels on top. Yeah. Uh, and they, that's a stone that's laying on that's top right. of the They're two. Right, right on top of the others. <laughs> and it's cut, it has to be cut more, you know, like, like a flat, a wafer or whatever you'd want to call it, like a flat piece, because you notice those were flat. Yeah. If we take a look again at this picture, you can see that they're pretty flat yeah. in this artist's reconstruction uh, based on the real stones that survived. Yeah. Uh, they, were, they were dressed and that took some, some doing to do. But now another remarkable thing about these is that they fit into one yeah. another. Yeah. They're little notches, uh, not airtight or watertight certainly, but they fit so they wouldn't go bouncing around. And there was some sort of little gaps made or little little troughs made so that the uprights would not jiggle around inside the lintels so okay. that that would fit in some firm, stable way. Pretty remarkable. Jane, I don't want to get too technical, but just briefly, what's the theory on what, what kind of tools would they have used to, to cut these or to, to chop away at these stones? Uh, they, stone upon stone? stone or did upon we have stone, metal then? Stone upon stone was one thing, and yes, they were beginning to have metal in those okay. days. They could very well have had chisels okay. or used stones as a sort of chisel. Yeah. Another thing they might have done, especially since they're in a cold climate, is pour water into the natural fissures in the rock and then uh, see to it somehow that it stayed in there and let it freeze in there oh, yeah. and crack it apart on its own joints. Yeah, and that might have pretty. produced some nice flat surfaces sure, or things sure. that they could then dress. Yeah, oh, sure, thanks. So rather remarkable. But yeah, the lintels, I think almost certainly, they must have built mounds to get these yeah. great big flat things on top. Yeah, well, it certainly makes, it, it's, makes sense to, that they had to do something like that to, yeah. to, to, to do it. Now, they were pretty clever. <laughs> Now let's talk about some other interesting stuff. Who, what's the theories of the, who, who, who were the people that built this? 
well, give us a little bit about that now. Who, who, who did this or what do the archaeologists say and what, what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to think about who was there in okay. approximately 3000 BC, which was early, um, the, the native peoples of the island, which could all, probably already were Celtic because the Celtic migrations Celtics. were going on then. But in 3000 BC, the Neolithic period, it would certainly have been uh, an agricultural, a nature-based society. They would have had uh, nature gods and they would have been heavily dependent on weather for their situation. They would have grown crops and so on. Okay. And that leads you to think that perhaps this original circle, before they had the stones up, had something to do with that, perhaps with worship or thanksgiving or any one of a number of things. A number of burials were discovered round about there, just as interments in the ground, and they don't seem to have been terribly significant. Uh, there was a significant one later, a little farther north, but as far as at the very beginning, they seem to have been a rather small um, agricultural, nature-based society. Okay. But then as time went on, some 500 years later, uh, you have probably some changes coming in, and there was contact with the continent, with Europe, and other Celts, you know, kept, kept moving on, moving along, and this uh, uh, earth goddess civilization really began to be more influenced by some of the continental things. You find, for instance, axe uh, drawings, axe representations on things. Yeah. And at some time around there, there may have been uh, an addition of, of some more gods. But the orientation of Stonehenge is pretty interesting, too. Why is that? Um, because the, uh, the great big trilithon, the biggest one, points to the northeast, which was where the sun would have risen, or to the place where the sun would have risen on Midsummer Day. Okay. It's interesting that that's slightly off kilter now, but that's probably due to some astronomical things which occurred at least twice before uh, the birth of Christ, the year at the year length, length of days changed, which would throw it off slightly. Yeah, sure. But it's, it was beautifully made, truly made, and they, they clearly were interested in keeping track of the equinoxes. Um, and we and and you're reaching that conclusion because of the location of, of the stones themselves. Well, because of this orientation, yeah, okay, so they could right, keep track yeah, of right. the sunrise yeah. at the shortest day or the longest day of the year, which of course also enabled them to keep track of it. Um, they had I forgotten what they had something else there that where they could keep track of the shortest day as well, the sunrise and the shortest day, and they must have been terribly frustrated. You know, the weather is not always so nice in that area, when it was cloudy yeah. and they didn't get a sunrise. How could they tell? Yeah. But being agricultural like that at the beginning, uh, that would be a serious worry. Yeah, if the sun was going to get to that point and then stop and then not turn and go around and get weather get warm again, that would be disaster for them. Yeah. So. But what, what is the theory of, of at, at, at when, they, when it was originally built, or the beginning of the, of the building of itself, which took, what, around 400 years probably or long? A good four or five hundred what, years. What's the theory of what, it, what the intent was of, of this? Was, was it because of, of what you just described, or was it because of a religious type thing? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, there are, of course, some different theories, yeah. but there's no reason why they couldn't all be true. Um, inside, at one point of its history, there was a large flat stone which would have been ideal as an execution stone. Uh, whether it was that or whether it was a special presentation stone, and this was not a blue stone, incidentally. Yeah. Uh, so presentation, um, giving offerings, sacrificing, thanksgiving for a good harvest. Have they found bones or anything, any, any evidence of that in, in, within not the circle? No. Not around there, not okay. of any certain, not of any mass sacrifices or anything. Yeah. And certainly in the early days they wouldn't have done that because those people really didn't go in for things like that. Yeah. But the, the purpose of it um, seems to have been partly uh, astronomical, the seasons, keeping track of the seasons, and partly some form of, uh, as I say, of worship or uh, burial ceremonies, honoring the dead. There might have been a grain of truth in, in the Merlin story that 
It was to honor some particular event or some particular group. Uh, much later, uh, uh, the archaeology was much later, you know, just in, in that article in the Smithsonian yeah. that you had. Uh, they uncovered a grave there, quite an important grave, what they call the Amesbury Archer, somewhat north of Stonehenge. In, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Amesbury. Tell us a little bit about that. That was rather interesting. Well, pretty interesting on a lot of fronts. Uh, they call it the Archer because uh, the grave was full of things to accompany the dead man, uh, showing, first of all, that he was well off. He was no poor wanderer. And this was because of the things they had the within Things that were in the, the grave. Yeah. Uh, including the arrowheads, and also there was a pair of what's undoubtedly wrist wristlets for an archer, the kind the archer would have worn. Oh, yeah. uh, he had been wounded. Um, he had been sick. He had a, he had a, a missing kneecap, and he was he was with uh, he was about what 40, 45. Yeah. A younger man was with him, and that article states that it, without proving it in any way that they came from the Alpine regions, Central Europe. And we don't know, maybe there was something in the DNA because uh, you know they've been doing a lot of experimenting with that. Take any given person in America or England and look at their DNA and see if they hook up you know, with the Near East or yeah, whatever. Sure. Uh, so that may be what that's based upon. But that's interesting too. And that contributed to a theory that perhaps this place was a healing spot uh, they haven't found any, any uh, particularly medicinal healing springs around, but uh, that's not impossible either. Uh, but someplace like, like Lourdes, perhaps, where the person would come. But the blue stones, there was one little fragment. This is in tradition, uh, tradition only, that when they got wet, or if you deliberately poured water over them, bathed them in water, as this old text says, that water would have medicinal properties from having okay. run over the blue stones. Yeah. So there's not a lot of evidence that it was a spa or anything like that, but there is some. But Jane, the fact that, uh, that uh, this body there well, it came, it came from the Alpine region would mean that the, 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 there was wide knowledge then of, of, of this spot. Would, wouldn't it, could, it you would. could conclude that. And that, yep. that, that people would actually come here for that purpose then. For, uh, the ancient for, Greeks knew yeah. about it. In yeah. the fifth century, you know, the heyday of Athens. Yeah. And everybody knew about those tin mines, you know, in Cornwall, yeah. because the ocean currents, when the Celts migrated westward, some of them went by sea. And you'd go up the coast there past Spain and France, you'd wind up at Ireland, and the western prominences of the island of Britain. Yeah. So they found they found the tin right away. And of course, Bronze Age, you can't have a Bronze Age yeah. without having tin yeah. to mix in with your copper. Uh, so the, the Greeks knew yeah. about it. And Was there any evidence uh, around Stonehenge that there were villages close? Not really. No. There no. were settlements. Is that strange or not? Or um, is, can you reach any kind probably of Probably not. Yeah. I don't think. This is just off the top of my head, but I don't yeah. think there was a lot uh, for livelihood there. There yeah. weren't forests, or there weren't any other thing that would suggest to you. And they, they didn't uh, mow the fields, but chalk downs. I guess they didn't plant the fields all that much, uh -huh. small, in a small way. But the uh, exact, uh, exact purpose is hard to tell. That's why I think perhaps all of the above may have played a role in constructing that. But whatever the first thing was, it must have been something, I mean, whoever conceived this grand plan, uh, it, well, it was a grand plan indeed, because if it took it four or 500 be. years yeah. to do that by hand, everything by hand, uh, they, they had some strong purpose, but there's really no indication of what it was. The Greeks refer to there being a great shrine of Apollo there. Now, Apollo shrines tended to be round, all the shrines weren't, and Apollo would have been their translation of whatever the god was that the locals were celebrating. Yeah. So if the locals had, had uh, uh, absorbed a little more from the European cultures of the time and had gotten away from just the, the earth goddess, supposing they were going into a sky, sun god, yeah. this would make the, the orientation even more important because maybe they kept track of other things beside the sun. Well, Jane, that leads me and, to, uh, to uh, another question, the fact that uh, 
that there weren't any villages close by would indicate, you know, what you said earlier about the orientation, that that, that was a perfect site for that. Would, mm -hmm. would that. Is that a reasonable conclusion or, or what, you know? Well, in other words, it stuck out by itself, more or less, not next to a village or villages. Yeah, well, it could have played a role in making it, you know, very important. Yeah. You know, nobody comes, yeah. you know, that's quite, I think that's probably yeah. very possible. Now, are there any other, were there any other spots in, in, in around Europe or so that, that were similar to what we're talking about here? Uh, tell yes. Us a little, tell us a little bit was, about that. We've got about five minutes, so about we five minutes? talk about uh, that a little bit. Of course, Stonehenge, let's say right off, was far and away the most monumental, the, the, the biggest, showing the most imagination in, in constructing. But in all of the Celtic parts of Britain, you find stones. You go to Brittany and you find these stones. They call them menhirs, oftentimes the smaller ones. Oh, yeah. Uh, but on the continent itself, you find stone structures where there are these stones, of course. But it's a Celtic thing, but mainly this, this far western edge Celtic. Because the Celts, I guess, had blended in with the others by then. But by the time they got to Britain, they were, uh, there had been something there before. The Picts, I believe, go back. A long yeah. way, and they were natives of the northern part. And there are lots of legends and lots of, of, of histories, quote unquote, written in 13th, 14th centuries, that talk about the how the Celts came to Ireland and then how they were shunted off to Scotland because they, the Irish didn't want them marrying all their women. A lot of the, these Celts <laughs> were seafarers, and they yeah. wanted to settle, so they wanted some women. So according to one of them, Lyman's Brute, the British history, they they made a deal with the Scots. That, that they could have some of their ladies to take with them, but they would have to, uh, you know, stay over there, and they'd have to uh, acknowledge the old bond, yeah. and they'd have to be matriarchal too. There was a matriarchal society, yeah. and of course they could have trickled down. Yeah, the the uh, uh, but but the purpose of, of the others that uh, that were around were, were basically the same as this. Have they was that the conclusion? Um, or do we really know? The ones in Brittany were more burial things. Yeah, okay. Uh, we were in Brittany, and really wasn't an awful lot to be found out about it there, except that there, there, were, there were more of the cave nature and lines, long lines of things. Now, they could have been more on the astronomical line. Yeah. And I think the ones in the Hebrides and in Scotland and up in that area uh, are lines, uh, alignments. Yeah. Well, there's one, one last little interesting point. You know, these people that believe in the electrical grid, yeah. the mysterious electrical grid over the earth, uh, they draw their ley lines, they call them L-E-Y, ley lines. They draw them from some of these old sites to others, and, and they're, they're uh, centers of electrical energy. Well, a lot of them converge at where Stonehenge is. Really? And I've not looked into the ley line thing a lot. I remember reading about it a little bit. No, I haven't read anything about and that. And uh, it sounds harebrained a little bit, but on the other hand, a lot of things have sounded harebrained that yeah. later proved to be true. So that, that's another role that if there were such a thing, that there might have been some sort of a magnetic line, you know how birds allegedly fly by magnet. There might have been some pattern of electrical thing that made that site, you know, if they liked it. Maybe they had some way of sort of dousing, you know, and find a place on the ground yeah. where they think we'll build here. You know, yeah. That, uh, yeah. Okay, Jane, that's been very, very interesting, and thank you so much. We're about at the end of our, our time here, and uh, let me, don't, don't run away. And with that, we'd like to thank Jane for her 10 years of insight and information and for educating us, uh, exploring history. Uh, Furthermore, um, congratulations, Jane, for, your, for this milestone. <laughs>